In this video, I will be discussing the female reproductive cycle that occurs each month from puberty to menopause. For females, the reproductive cycle can range anywhere from 24 to 35 days. However, for the purpose of this video, each cycle will be in duration of 28 days. This is the average length of the female reproductive cycle. I will begin by discussing the anatomy of the female reproductive system involved in the important phases of the reproductive cycle, including the ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, and cervix. After outlining the important anatomical structures, I will discuss the two different cycles that coincide with each other each month and therefore make up the female reproductive cycle. This is the uterine and ovarian cycles. I will also include the hormones secreted during the female reproductive cycle, which includes follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, inhibin, relaxin, and progesterone. Before we get into the two important cycles of the female reproductive system, it is important to understand the anatomical structures involved. The ovaries are the main site of folliculogenesis and oogenesis and are the focus of the ovarian cycle. Females have two fallopian tubes. Each one is connected to an ovary through finger-like projections known as fimbrae. Fallopian tubes are also known as oviducts, or uterine tubes, as they extend from the fundic region of the uterus. The uterus also known as the womb, is situated between the urinary bladder and rectum and is the focus of the uterine cycle. The uterus has an opening called the cervix. This allows sperm to travel from the vagina into the uterus and then up into the fallopian tubes. While there are certainly other reproductive structures, these are the structures that are important to keep in mind while discussing the events of the ovarian and uterine cycles. To start off, I will discuss the details of the ovarian cycle, which consists of the phases required for the development and release of a mature secondary oocyte. This cycle can be split into three separate phases, the follicular phase, the ovulation phase, and the luteal phase. Remember that the average reproductive cycle for a woman is around 28 days long. Therefore, for the purposes of this discussion, we will discuss a 28-day cycle. Before discussing the three phases of the ovarian cycle, it is important to briefly discuss oogenesis, which is the process by which a mature secondary oocyte forms each month. The process of oogenesis actually begins during fetal development. During this time, cells within the ovaries differentiate into millions of ogonia, which are diploid stem cells that will later produce germ cells. Most of these ogonia will degenerate through a process called atresia. The remaining ogonia became primary oocytes that begin meiosis I, but become dormant during late prophase. Before puberty, each primary oocyte becomes surrounded by follicular cells, resulting in a primordial follicle surrounding each primary oocyte. Once females reach puberty, the primordial follicles begin a process called folliculogenesis. <laughs> 
Folliculogenesis is the process by which the follicles develop as the oocytes inside develop. This leads us to the discussion of the first stage in the ovarian cycle, the follicular phase. This phase takes place between days 1 and 14 of the female reproductive cycle. Each month, the gonadotropins FSH and LH stimulate the development of several primordial follicles, but only one reaches maturity. Primordial follicles then develop into primary follicles, which are characterized by several layers of follicular cells now referred to as granulosa cells. It is also important to note that there is a clear glycoprotein layer that forms between the primary oocyte and the granulosa cells known as the zona pellucida. That would be this brown portion right here. As the follicular phase progresses, a single primary follicle continues to mature into a secondary follicle, ultimately becoming a larger follicle known as a mature graphene follicle. Just before the graphene follicle ruptures during ovulation, the diploid primary oocyte completes meiosis I, thus producing two haploid cells. One of the haploid cells produced is the first polar body, a discarded pack of nuclear material with very little cytoplasm. The other haploid cell is the secondary oocyte. With the completion of meiosis I and the subsequent formation of the secondary oocyte and first polar body, meiosis II begins. However, meiosis II is stopped in metaphase. The graphene follicle ruptures, and the secondary oocyte and first polar body are released into the fallopian tube. This defines the ovulation phase. The final phase of the ovarian cycle is the luteal phase. which takes place between days 15 and 28 of the reproductive cycle. At this point, there are two different outcomes that can occur. First, fertilization can occur, which is when the sperm penetrates the secondary oocyte. If fertilization does occur, then the secondary oocyte resumes and completes meiosis II. This results in the secondary oocyte splitting into an ovum and a second polar body. Just like the first polar body, the second polar body will degenerate. Once the nucleus of the haploid sperm fuses with the nucleus of the haploid ovum, we have a diploid zygote which can then develop into an embryo. Meanwhile, remember that ruptured graphene follicle? It becomes the corpus luteum. which remains within the ovary, producing large amounts of progesterone. If fertilization does not occur, then the ruptured graphene follicle develops into the corpus luteum and eventually degenerates into the corpus albicans. The secondary oocyte and the first polar body will degenerate and be eliminated from the body during menstruation. This leads us into the uterine cycle, the other cycle occurring during the monthly female reproductive cycle. For this cycle, it is important to start off with the different layers of the uterus. The myometrium is the muscular layer, which is responsible for uterine contractions. The endometrium is the 
inner layer of the uterus, which contains a large amount of blood vessels, epithelial tissue, connective tissue, and endometrial glands. The endometrium is actually divided into two different sublayers, the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. Both of these layers play an important role in the uterine cycle. At the exact same time as the ovarian cycle, the uterine cycle is taking place to prepare the uterus to receive the zygote, of course, should fertilization occur. This preparation of the uterus is referred to as the uterine cycle and is divided into four phases. The menstrual phase, the pre-ovulatory phase, the ovulation phase, and the post-ovulatory phase. The menstrual phase occurs between days 1 and 5 of the 28-day reproductive cycle. This phase is characterized by a significant decrease in estrogen and progesterone. The drop in estrogens and progesterone stimulate prostaglandins to constrict the uterine ar arteries, which leads to decreased blood flow to epithelial cells of the stratum functionalis. The result is a mass die-off of cells due to oxygen deprivation. The combination of myometrial contractions with vascular spasms of the degenerating weakened blood vessels cause the detachment and shedding of the stratum functionalis. Along with sloughed off epithelial cells and broken blood vessels, blood, interstitial fluid, and mucus are also released during menstruation. The menstrual flow passes out of the uterus through the cervix and vagina to exit the body. This leaves behind only the stratum basalis, which leaves behind a thin endometrial layer. The next step of the uterine cycle is the pre-ovulatory phase, which takes place between days 6 and 13 of the reproductive cycle. The length of this phase can vary, however, and accounts for most variation in the length of female cycles. During the pre-ovulatory phase, the estrogens that are secreted into the blood by developing ovarian follicles stimulate the process to repair the endometrium. The endometrial glands begin to develop, the endometrium thickens, and the blood vessels lengthen and expand outwards. This phase is also referred to as the proliferative phase because during this phase, the uterus is proliferating in thickness and structures are rapidly redeveloping since the prior menstruation. Ovulation occurs around day 14 and involves the rupture of the graphene follicle releasing the secondary oocyte into the fallopian tube. This phase is initiated because high levels of estrogens at the end of the pre-ovulatory phase stimulate a peak release of LH from the anterior pituitary gland. This peak in LH is called the LH surge, and it triggers the graphene follicle to rupture and release the secondary oocyte into the fallopian tube. It's this LH surge that is the basis for ovulation tests used by people attempting to have a child and wanting to know when it is the best time to copulate and conceive. Finally, the post-ovulatory phase occurs between day 15 and 28. During this phase, the corpus luteum in the ovaries continues and maintains the growth of the stratum functionalis layer of the uterus.
Progesterone secreted from the corpus luteum stimulates the continued growth and development of the blood vessels and endometrium glands. Progesterone secreted from the corpus luteum stimulates the continued growth and development of the blood vessels and endometrial glands. Now that I have discussed the uterine and ovarian cycles separately, while briefly mentioning the hormones involved, I will do a quick overview to summarize the entire female reproductive cycle. To start the menstrual phase of the cycle, the hypothalamus increases the secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Which in turn stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. In response to the release of FSH and LH, the primordial follicles develop into primary and then secondary follicles in the ovaries. At this point, they are primary oocytes within the follicles. At the same time, estrogen and progesterone levels have declined, thus stimulating the release of prostaglandins which constrict the uterine arteries. The end effect is the sloughing off of the stratum functionalis. In the pre-ovulatory phase, the secondary follicles secrete estrogen and inhibin. The single dominant follicle in one of the ovaries becomes larger. Due to the secretion of estrogen and inhibin, the smaller follicles go undergo atresia while the dominant follicle develops into the graphene follicle, which contains the secondary oocyte and the first polar body. Meanwhile, in the uterus, Estrogens released by the developing ovarian follicles stimulate the repair of the endometrium. This allows the stri striatum basalis to undergo mitosis to produce a new striatum functionalis through the endometrial thickening, blood vessel lengthening, and new endometrial glands developing. Next, the level of estrogens reach such a high level that it exerts positive feedback on the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland. As a result, a surge in LH occurs. Shortly after the LH surge, the graphene follicle ruptures and the secondary oocyte and first polar body are expelled into the fallopian tube. After the graphene follicle ruptures, it is transformed into the corpus luteum through the influence of LH and will begin secreting high levels of estrogen, inhibin, and progesterone. The estrogens and progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum stimulate continued and maintained growth of the stratum functionalis. Inhibin is a hormone that inhibits the release of FSH. Which essentially signals the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary gland that new follicles and oocytes do not need to develop at this given moment. If the secondary oocyte is not fertilized, then the corpus luteum transforms into the corpus albicans while the levels of estrogen inhibin and progesterone decrease. The levels of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, FSH, and LH begin to rise in preparation for a new ovarian cycle. The significant drop in the levels of estrogen and progesterone causes menstruation.
If the oocyte is fertilized, then the corpus luteum is rescued from degradation through the human chorionic gonadotropin, which maintains the secretory ability of the corpus luteum. The high levels of progesterone and estrogens released by the corpus luteum will continue to stimulate the endometrial glands to secrete nutrients for the developing embryo while also maintaining the integrity of the uterus as the pregnancy continues. This completes one 28-day female reproductive cycle. All these processes will repeat each month from puberty to menopause. I hope this educational video gives you a good overall picture in helping to understand the major events and hormones involved in the female reproductive cycle.